Good morning. I'm Sister Andrea Lee, and through his own self, Archbishop Flynn introduced me to Jesus in a way I had not known him before. And that relationship, his, mine, and ours, led him to ask me to share some thoughts this morning. What a humbling privilege. When sisters in my congregation die, the memorial card says, in the evening of life, we shall be judged on love. If that's true, though he would never describe it in competitive terms, race over and won, game, set, match, the Super Bowl ring of the spiritual life belongs on his finger. Examples abound of the love Archbishop Flynn exuded, pure, generous, forgiving, unvarnished, and far-reaching reflecting his many deep relationships, expressed as by Christ within the particular life circumstances of each person. He showed love through prayer and by showing up, by his holy hospitality and wicked blueberry pies. He showed it with his flip phone every day and with his prodigious memory for name and the details of people's lives. Relationships with family, friends, priests, and Episcopal brothers, women religious, victims and offenders, professional colleagues, and occasional acquaintances. In Albany, the Adirondacks, at Mount St. Mary, in Lafayette, and here in our archdiocese and city. In a special way, relationships with his caretakers and close friends, his physicians and medical aides, sisters Dolores, Maria, and Antonia, Patrick Willis and Bobby Dawson, Peter and Lulu, well, four generations of dailies, John Malone and Father Johnson, Dermot Gallagher and Dan Danny Dobozinski, Richard Schuslag, Chris Flugmacher, Megan, Katie, and me, and without doubt, Archbishop Hebda. I've known Archbishop Flynn for nearly a quarter century, seems like all my life, but it was the chance occurrence of being at Scroon Lake in 2009 when he was hospitalized with Legionnaire's pneumonia that drew us closer as friends and spiritual companions. Arriving at night and learning that he had been rushed to the hospital in Glens Falls, I raced back down the mountain, violating his every admonition about the fifth commandment and speeding to find him in ICU, perilously close to death. When a nurse barricading the door asked my relationship to him, I quickly responded, I'm his sister, in order to gain access to his bedside. <laughs> it was clear by the tight grip of Archbishop's hand that he wanted very much to live. So I and his nieces, Nancy and Marianne, began searching for a priest to anoint him and badgering the doctors to not assume that this was just another elderly man about to die. A new doctor arrived, a culture revealed the precise infection he had, medicines were changed, and a simply amazing recovery followed. Since then, Archbishop has faced significant health challenges, but that did not stop him. Earlier during this final decade, confirmations, parish visits, counseling of young seminarians and seasoned pastors, 
weddings, baptisms, funerals, and jubilees, lavishly entertaining so many friends, aided in recent months by Danny's and sometimes Lulu's wonderful cooking, including on holidays when his practice of gathering those without nearby friends and family continued unabated, right up until his firm decision to enjoy a last summer at Scroon Lake with Megan and Katie. The Archbishop's customary gratitude expressed to the small group of friends who collaborated to make that possible. Weakened, frail, and daily growing more so, it was just pure joy to watch him at the lake, learning to order Alexa around. Alexa, play Andrea Bocelli. Alexa, empty the dishwasher. <laughs> Laughing at his own joke, as he often did. Alexa, give Megan a treat. And of course, never missing those required 5 p.m. Flynn gatherings. It was no accident when Father Deese and I hosted a grand celebration in 2010 to celebrate the Archbishop's Golden Jubilee of Ordination that we titled the testamentary book, Love is the Goodness, We Gladly Applaud, lyrics from a song sung for him that evening. Inside the book, an exquisite and intimate array, dozens and dozens of deeply personal and creatively expressed examples of the love that we experience and gladly applaud, evident again and again in this priest's meaningful, often transformational engagement in our most joy-filled and most wrenching moments. Of course, while loving him and knowing that he loved us, probably more than a few of us had ended up on the wrong end of, well, I'll just call it his Irish temperament. I might be at the head of that parade. My most grievous offense, one I shared with Richard Schuslock on a brutally hot July day in Scroon Lake, thinking it was a grand idea to take his beloved dogs across, in his view, a dangerous road to go swimming in the lake. We had a splendid time, Megan and Katie and I, until our tri triumphant return to treats for the dogs and a stern correction for me. In his concern for our safety, it was clear where I stood in that hierarchy. <laughs> we ended the day, as I've often heard him do, with his final word on the subject. Sister, the page has turned. Nurtured by family and the Albany CSJs, Archbishop Flynn deepened his loving ways over his lifetime because of his prayerful focus on the kind and merciful Jesus we encounter in the gospel and because of his deep and daily love for the Eucharist. I've attended hundreds of liturgies with Archbishop Flynn, from magnificent celebrations in this cathedral, at St. Catherine or St. Thomas, at my inauguration, at Julie Sullivan's, at cemeteries and in nursing homes, at countless funerals for his brother priests and often their parents, for his friends and colleagues and religious sisters across the country the Daughters of Charity, the CSJs, IHMs, Little Sisters of the Poor, as well as liturgies in New York or in his home here, of late celebrated by his close friends, Fathers Malone and Johnson. No liturgy, though, has been more personally meaningful to me than one I'll close with by describing. I was alone with him at Scroon Lake. He was weak, his eyes failing, and so he trusted neither his sight nor memory, nor strength to actually preside. We began praying, and I read the readings and the gospel. His voice was strong in responding to the psalm, his heart deeply focused on the word. He preached a homily a few words for me. We prayed the bidding prayers together, but then what? And I remembered a recording on my phone of Michael Jonkis singing the Eucharistic prayer from his Mass of Reconciliation with a combined St. Thomas, St. Catherine choir. It was a graced and holy time with Archbishop Flynn and with God. We pray the Our Father gifted each other with peace, and then he sent me to the other room to bring a host that he had previously consecrated for us to break together. And so, as is the great gift of our faith, especially at the time of death and loss, 
In a moment, we'll move into the Eucharistic celebration that so defined Archbishop's life and ministry. Do this in memory of the Lord Jesus Christ, whom our dear Harry loved and served so well. And do it as well in memory of our altar Christus, his grace, the most reverend Harry Joseph Flynn, our dear friend, pastor, confessor, gifted storyteller, gracious host, and very much loved Archbishop. Before we begin the evocative rituals of this liturgy, allow me to thank Sister Andrea for her beautiful words and indeed for the presence of so many of you here this morning who very much like Sister share incredible memories of Archbishop Flynn. I'm so grateful that you've shared them in such abundance in these days. We're very blessed to have not only so many priests and deacons and seminarians and uh, members of the uh, Knights of Malta and the Equestrian Order and the Knights of Columbus and so many lay faithful from throughout this archdiocese, but also to have those family members that Sister mentioned who were seated here in the front who took such great care of Archbishop Flynn in these weeks. He so much wanted to make sure that you knew how grateful he was for your care. How delighted to have with us this day, not only, as I mentioned, the priest concelebrants, but uh, our bishops who are here as well in such great number. We're going to be blessed this day to have Cardinal Supic offer the final commendation this day. Cardinal Supic was the first bishop that Archbishop Flynn had the opportunity to consecrate. We speak about apostolic succession. That was that. We have this opportunity to hear uh, Cardinal Supic and to be in his presence this day at this significant time. Also, these other bishops, many of whom were consecrated by Archbishop Flynn. Archbishop Laurie, William Laurie of the Archdiocese of Baltimore, will be offering the homily this day. He's known Archbishop Flynn since he was a seminarian. Imagine all of those years, all of that example. I suspect that even a few of these bishops do imitations of Archbishop Flynn. Huh? <laughs> but we're delighted to have all of you present. Please stand. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the Father of mercies, the God of all consolation, be with you. And with your spirit. In the waters of baptism, Archbishop Harry Flynn died with Christ and rose with him to new life. May he now share with him eternal glory.
the spring. Almighty and merciful God, eternal shepherd of your people, listen to our prayers and grant that your servant Harry, once our Archbishop, to whom you entrusted the care of this church, may enter the joy of his eternal master, there to receive the rich reward of his labors. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. A reading from the Book of Wisdom. The souls of the just are in the hand of God, and no torment shall touch them. They seemed, in the view of the foolish, to be dead, and their passing away was thought an affliction, and their going forth from us utter destruction. But they are in peace, For if before men indeed they be punished, yet is their hope full of immortality. Chastised a little, they shall be greatly blessed, because God tried them and found them worthy of himself. As gold in the furnace, he proved them, and as sacrificial offerings, he took them to himself. Those who trust in him shall understand truth, and the faithful shall abide with him in love, because grace and mercy are with his holy ones, and his care is with his elect. The word of the Lord. Senior, insegna me tus cammin. 
A reading from the letter, the first letter of St. Peter. Tend the flock of God in your midst, not by constraint, but willingly, as God would have it. Not for shameful profit, but eagerly. Do not lord over those who are assigned to you, but be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd is revealed, you will receive your unfading crown of glory. The word of the Lord.
Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said to the crowds, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. The Jews quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus said, said to them, Amen, Amen. I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I have life because of the Father, and so also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, unlike your ancestors who ate and still died. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. The Gospel of the Lord. My dear friends in Christ, let me remind you of the uh, premise upon which this homily is based. Like hundreds of alumni of Mount St. Mary's Seminary in Emmitsburg, Maryland, I happily and proudly claim Archbishop Harry J. Flynn as my rector. Father Flynn, as we then knew him, led Mount St. Mary's Seminary from 1970 until 1979. Long after I was ordained a priest and bishop, I habitually addressed Archbishop Flynn as Father Rector, and he habitually addressed me as Student Laurie. I'm pretty sure he was happy that his former student became Archbishop of Baltimore, but I'm even more certain that he really liked the fact that I own a dog, a golden retriever, but not named Megan or Katie. 
Discussing this homily with Archbishop Hebda, we recalled that back in 1990, then Bishop Flynn of the Diocese of Lafayette in Louisiana served as a delegate to the month-long Synod of Bishops in Rome, a synod that was dedicated to priestly formation. The synod and the papal document that followed it are notable for bringing clearly into focus four dimensions of priestly formation, human formation, spiritual formation, intellectual formation, and pastoral formation. In that phone conversation, Archbishop Hebda observed that long before these four dimensions of formation were so clearly spelled out, Archbishop Flynn embodied them and lived them. Recognizing that the Archbishop was inspired by the Holy Spirit, I promptly stole his idea, and I have made it the outline of everything I will henceforth say. So, seeing Archbishop Flynn through the lens of human formation, let's begin with this. Archbishop Flynn was a wonderful, wonderful human being. He was warm, had a beautiful sense of humor, never forgot a name or a face, and he wrote out his Christmas cards in July, <laughs> always with that personal note inside with his distinctive handwriting. I remember moving in on my first day at Mount St. Mary Seminary in 1973. I had met my roommate, got unpacked, and was walking down the hall when I heard from behind me Father Flynn's distinctive voice call out a Mr. Lorry. I thought to myself, how does he know my name already? And how did he recognize me from the back? <laughs> I soon realized by the time all 170 of us seminarians had walked through the door, Father Flynn could recognize each of us by sight front and back, and call our names. All of us here today appreciate that wonderful gift that God gave to the Archbishop. His sister said so well, it's not just that he remembered our names, he knew us, he loved us. He had this beautiful capacity for hospitality and friendship, a capacity that, that created a real sense of community, a real sense of camaraderie, not only in the seminary, but also in the parishes and dioceses where he served. Archbishop Flynn also maintained a keen sense of humor, even when rightfully irritated. My second year at the Mount, my room was directly above Father Flynn's rooms. On a Sunday afternoon, I was busily typing a term paper on a large and noisy electric typewriter placed on a rickety typing table with no carpet on the floor. It must have sounded like a jackhammer down below. By and by, there was a knock at the door, whereupon Father Flynn entered. Yes, Father Flynn, said I, to which he replied, Mr. Lorry, if you don't stop typing, I'll be forced to break both your arms. <laughs> I complied. Throughout his ministry, whether as a seminary rector or a bishop, Archbishop Flynn demonstrated an uncommon degree of common sense. When we seminarians were in a kerfuffle 
about some problem or controversy, he would calm the waters and help us distinguish between what's important and what's not, and then refocus us on our responsibilities. At a time when seminary formation was in flux, when there was some confusion, Father Flynn kept us focused on essentials like prayer or building community or learning charity. Like the souls of the just described in our reading from the Book of Wisdom, the Archbishop entrusted as many cares and burdens to the Lord, confident that he was safe in God's hands, confident that life's chastisements, whether they be illness or controversy, were signs of God's love and a crucible for the purification of one's mind and heart. Is it any wonder that Archbishop Flynn was deeply loved wherever he served, by laity, by priests and deacons and his fellow bishops, by seminarians, and by religious women and men? Truly, truly, his humanity was a bridge to Christ. Let's look now at Archbishop Flynn through the lens of spiritual formation. You know, when you enter a seminary, you expect to focus on the spiritual life. You expect those in charge to tell you about the importance of prayer, the types of prayer and how to pray. But nothing, nothing substitutes for the power of good example. Every afternoon around four o'clock, Father Flynn could be seen sitting in front of the tabernacle at St. Bernard's Chapel at Mount St. Mary's, praying. Busy as he was, he was never too busy to pray. He once said, give me eight hours of sleep at night and one hour before the Blessed Sacrament and I'll do anything the church will ask of me. Whether at the Mount or Lafayette or here, here in the Twin Cities or his beloved home on Scroon Lake, prayer was the golden thread that ran throughout the life of this great human being, priest and bishop. Small wonder that the Archbishop chose for his funeral mass, passage from the Bread of Life discourse from John's Gospel, a passage where Jesus reveals himself both as the source of divine wisdom and above all, as our food and drink. For it is by partaking of the Lord's body and blood in the Eucharist that we share ever more deeply in his death and resurrection and in his intimate relationship of love with the Father, that love who is the Holy Spirit. Archbishop Flynn passionately believed in the Eucharist and centered his life on the Eucharistic Lord. He knew everything, everything flows from prayer and his experience taught him that the Eucharist really is the source and summit of our lives, our lives as individuals and as communities, whether a parish, a diocese, or a seminary. And because of his life of prayer, is it any wonder that this great archdiocese is blessed with an abundance of vocations. Let's take a look at the Archbishop through the lens of intellectual formation, beginning with this observation. He taught us seminarians not to take ourselves too seriously. Yes, he wanted us to study, wanted us to excel, but he also wanted us never to imagine 
that we were the next bright light for which the church was waiting with bated breath. He expected us to temper academic achievement with humility, humility before the God who is the source of wisdom and love. The Archbishop would never have thought of himself as a theologian, but as anyone who ever heard him preach can attest, he had an endless fund of stories, a powerful command of scripture, a brilliant way of using the English language, extensive knowledge of English literature, and used all those skills and more to communicate the good news. What's more, he is one of the few people I ever met who truly knew the difference between a metaphor and a simile. <laughs> if Archbishop Flynn's own gifts were more practical than speculative, he nonetheless appreciated the contributions of theologians, whether in his role as rector or his involvement in Catholic higher education, including St. Thomas University and the Catholic University of America. He tried to teach us as seminarians not to leap too quickly to conclusions about the soundness or lack of soundness of any one author or opinion, but rather to think things through calmly and prayerfully. Lessons of a lifetime. Let's take a concluding look at Archbishop Flynn's life through the critically important lens of pastoral formation. And in this, we are guided by St. Peter's first letter, where we read, tend the flock of God in your midst, not by constraint, but willingly, and not for shameful profit, but eagerly. Could there be a better description of Archbishop Flynn's ministry? He was a wise and loving shepherd after the heart of the chief shepherd, the Christ. He knew that truth and love are friends, not enemies. He knew the importance of mercy, listening to others, the importance of being present to people in their need. His was the voice you wanted to hear when discouragement set in or when illness struck, or when big problems loomed. His was the voice that helped so many to find consolation and direction and strength in the green pastures of God's love, just as the Good Shepherd promised. As our rector, Archbishop Flynn taught us, or tried to teach us, the importance of listening to our people the importance of gentleness in ministry, and the unimportance of our personal plans in the face of any pastoral need. As Sister said, long after the Archbishop retired, he continued to confirm to say mass in parishes, visit the sick, give retreats to seminarians, religious and priests, and so much more. To my mind, he was a priest, priest, and a bishop's bishop. And I don't need to tell anyone in St. Paul and Minneapolis or anyone in Lafayette how blessed you were to have Archbishop Harry J. Flynn as your shepherd. No discussion of the Archbishop's life would be complete without mentioning his warm and loving devotion to the Virgin Mary. Because his life was centered on the Christ of the Eucharist, so too his heart was warmed by Mary's maternal love. Daily, through the mysteries of the rosary, Mary led him to Jesus. And because he was so close to Jesus and his mother, Archbishop Flynn would want us 
who celebrate his life, never to forget to pray for him, never to forget to pray for the happy repose of his soul. And so with so much love, we commend you, Father Flynn, Father Rector, Archbishop Flynn, to the Lord of life and love, to the great Chief Shepherd you served so well. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Let us turn to the Lord and offer him these prayers. For the Universal Church, united under Francis our Pope, the College of Bishops, and all God's faithful, to grow in love of the Lord Jesus Christ, and proclaim him to the world, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Deus exaudinos, Señor For the Archdiocese of St. Paul and Minneapolis, inspired by Archbishop Flynn and his successors, may we serve this, may we follow the Spirit's direction for our local church. We pray to the Lord. For political leaders to work for justice, peace, and protection for the unborn, the homeless, the immigrant, and the poor, we pray to the Lord. and for justice and healing for all who have been wounded, we pray to the Lord. For the family and friends of Archbishop Flynn to receive comfort and support, and for all who grieve the loss of, of loved ones, we pray to the Lord. For the Knights and Ladies of Malta, of Columbus, and of the Holy Sepulchre, for the Little Sisters of the Poor, and of St. Peter Claver, for the Ancient Order of Hibernians, the Church 
of Lafayette and Albany, and all other groups dear to Archbishop Flynn, may they be strengthened in their charisms and receive support in their ministries. We pray to the Lord. For the eternal rest of Archbishop Harry Flynn, who shared in the high priesthood of Jesus Christ, may the Lord be merciful in judging him and welcome him into the banquet of the Lamb with all the faithful departed. We pray to the Lord. servant, Archbishop Harry Flynn, from among your priests, and endowed him with pontifical dignity in the apostolic priesthood, grant, we pray, that he may also be admitted to their company forever. Grant this through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at our hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. Be near, O Lord, we pray to your servant, Harry, on whose funeral day we offer you this sacrifice of conciliation, so that should any stain of sin have clung to him, or any human fault have affected him, it may by your loving gift be forgiven and wiped away through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Christ our Lord, for he is the salvation of the world, the life of the human race, the resurrection of the dead. Through him the host of angels adores your majesty and rejoices in your presence forever. May our voices, we pray, join with theirs in one chorus of exalted praise as we acclaim. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you.
In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice. And giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray upon the oblation of your church and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself, grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with St. Paul, and with all the saints, on whose constant intercession we rely for your unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation be pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant Francis, our Pope, Bernard, the bishop of this local church, be your unworthy servant, the order of bishops and all the clergy and the entire people your son has gained for you. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. Remember your servant, Harry, whom you have called in this world to yourself. Grant that he who was united with your son in a death like his may also be one with him in his resurrection when from the earth he will raise up in the flesh those who have died and transform our lowly body after the pattern of his own glorified, glorious body. To our departed brothers and sisters too, and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory, when you will wipe away every tear from our eyes for seeing you, our God, as you are, we shall become like you for all the ages and praise you without end. Through him and with him and in him, O God, almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, 
we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed.
Let us pray. Lord God, whose Son left us in the sacrament of his body, food for the journey, mercifully grant that, strengthened by it, our brother Archbishop Harry Flynn may come to the eternal table of Christ, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Before we proceed to the final commendation, just a few words of thanks. My understanding is that Archbishop Flynn would thank everybody every time. <laughs> and so you know that he's thanking you in his heart for sure. But there are some particular words of thanks uh, that are necessary as we move towards the end of this celebration. Certainly to all of those who have uh, prepared this liturgy. I'm so grateful. The choir was magnificent. That beautiful piece, uh, Come Lord Jesus, was written by Charlie Romano, who blesses us this day uh, with his presence. He's uh, a, a friend. He's Lulu Daly's uh, nephew. And he wrote that piece for Archbishop Flynn's Jubilee. Uh, based on his Episcopal motto, and it was so helpful to the archbishop as he found himself weakening and indeed longing for the presence of the Lord to have that playing in the background always. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. So we make that our prayer today, but please, those of you involved in music ministry know how grateful we were for your presence and your participation this day. Certainly, Father Joseph Johnson, Father Eubel, the rector of this cathedral, uh, Father Mark Evishis, the diocesan uh, master of ceremonies, and all who were involved in the details of preparing, very grateful to you, as well as uh, to our lectors, Dermot and Danny, and uh, to all the seminarians who served, and to uh, certainly to the Archbishop Flynn would, would want to make sure we made special reference uh, to the many religious sisters who are here this day. Certainly they were represented by Sister Andrea in the liturgy, but their prayers are so important and they were always so close to Archbishop Flynn. So we're very grateful to them as well as to the consecrated men who were here. I, I learned today that Archbishop Flynn was an affiliate of the Christian Brothers. I knew I liked him. Huh? <laughs> To have all of these bishops here speaks volumes as well. Imagine, we're so grateful to Archbishop Laurie for the magnificent homily that captured Archbishop Flynn so well. So we know that that same wonderful Archbishop that we knew here uh, was like that when he was rector of the seminary. There's that consistency that's there for sure. Amazingly, Archbishop uh, Laurie isn't the only Archbishop who was a, a seminarian under uh, Archbishop Flynn. We're very grateful to have Archbishop Jekylls here as well, the Archbishop of Dubuque, who also uh, was a Mountie and was formed by Archbishop Flynn. A number of these bishops who were here today were ordained or consecrated by Archbishop Flynn uh, from our province. We're very grateful. Some have traveled from farther afield. Anyone who knows Archbishop Flynn knows how uh, deeply uh, in love he was with the Diocese of Albany and the Diocese of Lafayette. So we're blessed to have their two bishops uh, with us this day as well. And uh, also uh, uh, Bishop Glenn Provo, also from Louisiana, from the Archbishop's time there. So we're grateful for all of their presence, for these the priests in the sanctuary uh, that the Archbishop asked that we would give special seating for because of the way in which they had served him in the course of his ministry and had indeed been great friends. Very uh, delighted uh, to welcome in all of you who are here to know that you're all uh, very much appreciated uh, for your participation this day. I now ask Cardinal Supic to lead us in the final commendation.
Just allow me a word of condolences to all of the friends and those who were family to Archbishop Flynn, our good, our good friend, a friend to us all. One scripture passage that comes to mind as I think about his life is that moment in the Gospels where Jesus is looking out at the people going to the temple treasury to offer their gifts. But he notices in particular the poor widow who gives only two pennies. And then he remarks, hers was the greatest of all gifts. Archbishop Flynn had that ability to be able to look at the lives of other people and see how God's grace was working in their lives. As Archbishop Hebden noted, I was the first of those to be ordained a bishop by him. And some years afterwards, I reminded him of that day in which I told him he seemed to be a bit nervous, especially during the anointing ceremony because he had his eyes fixed on the book, all the while taking the full carafe of chrism and proceeding to pour the entire amount on me. <laughs> I told him that I felt like I was hit by an oil tanker. He said, obviously you needed it. <laughs> but then he went on to say, he remembered most of all that moment in which my parents came down the aisle to offer the gifts at offertory. They shuffled because my father had suffered at that moment already from Parkinson's for a quarter of a century. And then he said, I noticed that they sat down and your mother patted your father's hand as if to say, we did it again together. And then he said, what a great witness of marriage. He had that ability to see how God's grace was working in the ordinary circumstances of people's life and gave a whole new definition to what it means to be a bishop as one who is an overseer. Not to point out the mistakes that are so obvious in our lives, but the graces in which God is working in that moment. That's what made him a great bishop and a great example to all of us who serve in that ministry. We'll miss him sorely. Trusting in God we have prayed together for Harry, and now we come to the last farewell. There is sadness in parting, but we take comfort in the hope that one day we will see him again and enjoy his friendship, although this community will disperse in sorrow. The mercy of God will gather us together again in the joy of the kingdom Therefore, let us console one another in the faith of Jesus Christ.
Into your hands, Father of mercies, we commend our brother Harry in the sure and certain hope that together with all who have died in Christ, he will rise with them on the last day. We give you thanks for the blessings which you bestowed on Harry in his life. They are signs to us of your goodness and of our fellowship with the saints in Christ. Merciful Lord, turn toward us. Listen to our prayers. Open the gates of paradise to your servant. Help us who remain to comfort one another with the assurances of faith until we all meet in Christ and are with you and with our brother forever. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Harry, may the angels lead you into paradise. May the martyrs come to welcome you and take you to the holy city, the new and eternal Jerusalem. Before we conclude, a very special word of thanks as well to the delegation that came from the Diocese of Gulu in Uganda. I think they win for coming the furthest. You might not know that, but there is an Archbishop Harry Flynn High School in Gulu, where there are 500 students who are praying with all of us this day. The bishop there has asked that every church in that diocese would offer mass today for Archbishop Flynn as well. So we're very grateful to them for their presence here today as well. Thank you. In peace, let us take our brother to his place of rest.
buses over there. Try and get in the same bus, please. Brothers. We'll proceed immediately to Resurrection Cemetery. You're all welcome to come.